Um, and we will be starting with our first speaker. Uh, we're very lucky to have him here today. Uh, he's the co-founder of both Volance and Sustainability, and he has worked in sustainability all his career and really shaped the sustainability agenda over the last decades. For example, he introduced the triple bottom line in the 1990s, and now he's working for system change, change which he calls Breakthrough. Please welcome John Elkington. My sound system working, it seems to be. All I can say is, wow, when I, when I, when I saw the you all residents doing that uh, uh, presentation, I thought, I'm going home now. I don't, I don't need to be here. I mean, you lot can uh, do it. Um, but the message that I have uh, for you today, if I can get the first slide up, um, is that you know, somebody once said that if you live in a time without challenges, you've been robbed. Because challenges are something that our species, uh, in the right circumstances, uh, responds to. And they, they can be enormously creative. And I think the biggest challenge that we have in the space that we'll be talking about uh, uh, over today is this one of how we educate people for the institution, which is most important in our societies, uh, which is uh, the world of business. And my question uh, is this. Is business education uh, ready for a product recall, or does it actually need a product recall? And it's not my uh, question. It actually came from a professor, some of you know, uh, an emeritus professor at INSEAD, uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Gen Genet. Um, and the reason why I've got this image of the uh, aircraft going through the sound barrier is that if you go back to the late 1940s, early 1950s, uh, there were people who said it was impossible to break through uh, the sound barrier. Uh, and there were many people who believed that. And then one person, Chuck Yeager, broke through, and very quickly a lot of other people went through. I think it's going to be the same with the sustainability barrier, that there are a lot of people who will tell you it's, it's simply not possible uh, to become uh, more sustainable in the way that we'll be discussing uh, later on. I think, it, I think it will prove to be, but in some quite unexpected uh, ways. And I've worked uh, now for 35, 40 years with business leaders around the world. The, these two are two of the business leaders I respect uh, most, uh, Dave Packard and, and, and Bill Hewlett of uh, HP, Hewlett Packard. And this is a, a painting, actually. I, I took the photograph of, of the painting, but it's in uh, HP Labs in, in, in uh, Palo Alto, and it shows the two founders of the company going into the garage or garage in which they, they founded the company and seeing this extraordinary uh, planet Earth. And I think, for me, that's a symbol of what thoughtful business leaders have, have, have experienced in the last few uh, decades. A very different agenda from the one that they were trained uh, to deal with has surfaced all around us. And unfortunately, very often, uh, education, and particularly business education, has been a lagging indicator of change. It wasn't true in, 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 in the uh, mid-70s, late-70s, but in recent decades, unfortunately, that has been true. And I think the, the case which uh, we may discuss later on, which just signals that in a way, is, is, is the case of Volkswagen. And, and there, are, there are other cases going on at the same time, but perhaps that's the most conspicuous uh, one at the moment. I'm trying to find an angle where I can get this to... Um, ah. So just a few words by uh, way of uh, introduction. Um, uh, I, I find it very difficult when I go through uh, immigration, as I do uh, uh, several times a week, um, to explain when I'm asked what do I do, uh, or what, uh, even what my education was. Very mixed. I won't read it out. But I've, I've, I've set up uh, four companies since 1978. Thankfully, in different ways, they all still uh, exist. I write. I sit at any one time on over 20 boards or advisory boards, which sounds crazy and probably is, but it's a wonderful way of continuously learning. And one of the things I do is, is um, get involved in uh, universities and, and, and business school uh, education. And, and, and two of the organizations I'm still involved in, Sustainability and Volans, are both now certified uh, B corporations. And when I think about education for business. I think the evolving world uh, of B corporations is immensely uh, exciting. This, there are just a, several quotes that I'll drop through the presentation as I, uh, as I go through. And this was from the Financial Times uh, a, a couple of years ago. And it was Sarah Murray just making the point 
But business schools increasingly are having to pull in practitioners because the, you know, the faculty members, the academics are struggling uh, with some of these uh, issues that we'll be talking about. So climate change, resource efficiency, uh, poverty, uh, mitigation uh, flagged up here. But, but sustainability seemed to be an absolutely critical area where this is increasingly uh, uh, the case. And I just wanted to say right at the beginning, some of you, uh, I, at least one of you saw me speak in Bonn uh, recently, and I, I probably used this slide, but I just wanted to make a very public health disclaimer. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never known what I'm doing. I've, I've never had a black box set of solutions where I know which button to press. So I very often find myself in boardrooms or C-suites. It's our natural habitat in a way. And I really envy James Bond, and, and, and really not for the obvious reasons, the, 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 the women and the fast cars. It's because he always knows which button to press, and I often don't. And what we have uh, developed is a capacity to stay inside boardrooms for long enough to work out what we're meant to be doing uh, there. Um, so that, with that disclaimer, I just want to say thank you to two people in the audience, uh, Alex Bakawi and Peter Zollinger. Um, privileged to have dinner with them last night, but both colleagues and I hope good friends and, 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 and typical of the people who I've learned from over uh, the years and decades uh, in this space. And I think one of the things that is a huge advantage of working in the sustainability space is not just the people who are here with intelligence and, and, and um, experience and so on, but it's a very generous uh, community. It doesn't mean you don't get competition and the rest of it. By God, you uh, do. But it, 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 it has been a a glorious experience to sort of learn with others. Um, but just, just so you know, uh, um, I'm always looking for the button to press, including this one. Um, so uh, it was kindly mentioned that the triple bottom line um, came from our stable uh, just over 20 years uh, ago. And, and, and the way we explained that to the wider world, so triple bottom line was 1994, people, planet, profit, 1995, uh, and it's funny, because I was just saying uh, a moment ago that I, I get bored quite easily. So you, you know, come up with these interesting new uh, concepts, and then you have to crank them around the world for sort of five, six, seven years, and then it, it becomes tedious. And, but it's amazing, the long wave cycle in this sort of space. And the triple bottom line has actually been coming back quite strongly, particularly through the world of social entrepreneurs. All of the 1,500 B corporations now have the triple bottom line built into their... Uh, uh, genetic code, if you like. And those of you who've seen the November uh, issue of Harvard Business Review uh, will have seen the, um, the, the, the survey of the 100 uh, most interesting, most effective CEOs around the world, and Lars Rabin Sorensen, uh, CEO of uh, Nova Nordisk, being right at the top, number one uh, position, and knocking, I think, Jeff Bezos of Amazon down to, uh, uh, I think, 87th position, which actually was quite nice. Um, uh, to see, but uh, the interesting thing about Nova Nordisk is they recharted themselves around the, trop, tr the triple bottom line quite some uh, years ago. So it's, it's fascinating to see uh, this agenda coming up. And then somebody else that I've worked with at Nova Nordisk uh, since 1989, uh, Lisa Kingo, has just taken over the UN Global Compact as uh, uh, the leader there. So again, you know, Sometimes you have to wait for quite a long time for, before some of these uh, new issues, new agendas, new approaches uh, come up uh, the curve in a way that is what you expected to happen much quicker uh, early on in the process. Having said all of which, uh, I'm an optimist. I really was born that way, and, and, and quite often in this field you, you have to face down some pretty big uh, uh, challenges, but um, I am an optimist, and that's something to... Uh, bear in mind as I, as I go forward. So it's already been mentioned that the next decade is significant. I'm just going to explain uh, why uh, we think that's the case. And um, I, in the slide introducing uh, myself, um, I mentioned that I had studied uh, economics at some point in my educational progress, such as it was. I gave up economics after one year. That was 1968. It seemed to have very little to do with what was going on in the wider world um, uh, at the time. But, but two economists stuck in my mind from that period of my education. Neither of them were liked by normal economists at that stage. One was Nikolai Kondratiev. The other was Joseph Schumpeter. And they both said the same thing, that these long wave cycles in our societies and in our economies, and there are periods where we go through 
uh, what he called, uh, as you know, uh, creative uh, destruction. Well, I think we're right in one of those periods at the moment. And some years ago, we put together a very simple uh, five-stage uh, model. So there's a moment where people wake up. There's a point where they become like Edison, intense experimenters. And, and, and I think we're headed into one of these periods where the, the rate of experimentation and failure is going to go off the curve. Companies, uh, either incumbent companies try and adapt to the new order or insurgent ones are set up, startups are, are set up to do the new things. They really need ecosystems of other actors, so Silicon Valley being a, a prime example. At some point, the system flips uh, and the economy as a whole uh, behaves in a new way. And I was in Rome uh, last week with Enel, uh, I think uh, the second biggest European uh, energy utility, the biggest one in Italy. Um, and... Um, the CEO, uh, Francesco Storacci, who I'd not uh, met before, but took the stage and started to uh, talk. It was stunning. I mean, basically, here is a company which has looked out at what's happening in the rest of Europe, what's happened to RWE, for example, what's happened to E.ON. Uh, some of you will know that um, the uh, European power utilities, I, I've got a slide on this a little later on, have lost over half their collective value in just a few years. So out of a market of about 1 trillion uh, euros, we've lost over 500 billion euros worth of value in very, very short order. And I'll just touch on why that's uh, happening. But I think Anel are playing in this sort of space, but very much trying to push into this sort of space. And listening to uh, Francesco talk, it was very clear that he has a very different vision uh, from most uh, CEOs, and certainly CEOs that I started to work with uh, 30 years ago or so. Uh, and in terms of trying to sort of capture some of this, um, late last year, uh, we published a book called The Breakthrough Challenge. My co-author was Jochen Zeitz at the top with a beard. Uh, the foreword was uh, written by uh, uh, Sir Richard Branson uh, with a beard. Um, and uh, the notion there was that tomorrow's bottom line will, um, as defined by leading leadership companies, place a much higher value on ambition and stretch uh, be part of efforts by business. The, the history of business has been uh, trying to lower, the, uh, level the, the playing field, but actually level it down so that people can compete effectively. What we're starting to see is certain types of business leaders looking at how you uh, level up uh, the playing field. The area of biomimicry, which I'm very actively involved in with but the Biomimicry Institute, increasingly uh, interesting, and, and, and the circular economy um, uh, notion really, really exciting. But the final point there is, is the point that I think none of you need persuading uh, about, which is that education is the single most important investment that we will make as societies uh, and economies. Good. So um, several of us were taking, talking earlier on today about um, uh, Twitter and, and, and tweeting, and I, I was just saying that every day I get five or six pieces of information from Twitter, which I wouldn't get uh, anyway uh, uh, in any different way. And uh, this was uh, early last year, Alex Steffen. I won't read out uh, the quotation here, but I, th th this basically uh, increasingly underpins, this perception underpins uh, the work that we do, the sense that the period from 2016 to 2025 are make or break, is, is make or break, that, that, that um, we, we have a period of time in order to get this right, uh, if we possibly can, and, and I find that uh, both challenging and uh, immensely exciting. And the context for all of this, uh, in terms of challenges, again, uh, and identifying them, is what some people are describing as a new normal. So I know Google Glass has been abandoned uh, by Google for the moment, but the, you know, the, the idea about Google Glass is it gives you a different perception uh, of, of, of reality in a way. And I think business leaders are going to find themselves um, seeing a very different uh, reality going forward. If you look at who've been the real educators in this space over time, one member of um, our advisory board, shown at the top in the orange, suit is Jerry Lindinger. He was one of those people. He was both a, uh, an astronaut and a cosmonaut. Uh, in the 1980s, went up, spent five months on the uh, Mir space station, uh, including the period where it spun out of control, caught fire, and so on. But like many of those um, space 
uh, explorers came back completely transformed, absolutely seeing a, a, a very different uh, reality. And his sense at that stage was that water security, access to clean water and so on, would be a fundamental issue. 2017 will be the 30th anniversary of the Brunton Commission Report. Grothan and Brunton, uh, one of the very early political leaders uh, to get involved in this space. Nowadays, business much more in the spotlight. And, and, and Paul Pullman, I sometimes think he should be called St. Paul for the number of times he pops up at uh, um, uh, conferences and is in the spotlight talking about uh, sustainability. Um, growing number of business leaders uh, are very active, but also, interestingly, city mayors are becoming uh, increasingly active. So Mayor, former Mayor Bloomberg of New York being an example of that, but also involved uh, in creating the C40 uh, group of cities, which is now, I think, up to 80-plus uh, cities uh, around the world. So a sequence uh, of people speaking up for this uh, agenda over time. And then, and, and then really conspicuously, just uh, earlier this year, Pope Francis doing the same uh, thing. And I, one, one of the countries that we work with is, in, it, one of the countries we work in is Mexico, been astonishing to see the impact of, of, of the uh, encyclical. Um, so another reason why I'm sort of quite optimistic. Um, leaders are waking up. But I've watched this at close quarters. So I, seven years I was on the faculty of the uh, World Economic uh, Forum and saw these sorts of issues, challenges, opportunities coming up uh, the agenda. And quite often the forum trying to actively manage them back down again so that people could focus on the real uh, issues as they then uh, saw them. And I think it's fascinating to see people like Peter Backer at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development now saying the sorts of things that we see him uh, quoted up, uh, up the top there. I mean, if you'd asked me who would say words like that uh, 10 years ago, I'd said Greenpeace, Oxfam, n not somebody who represents several hundred uh, major companies uh, around the world. And, and the World Economic Forum, as many of you will know, has done analysis about the underlying system dynamics. And um, this is our version of that uh, work. And it basically is um, what we're illustrating as a pressure cooker, with the heat being turned up, so demographic problems, uh, different forms of globalization, uh, global warming, those sorts of issues. And in the middle, a range of different uh, challenges increasingly interlinked, and it's no accident that they're uh, uh, increasingly sort of popping up with the security uh, 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 descriptor attached. And then sitting on the top, you know, the, the United Nations, uh, a range of different uh, governance institutions which we've inherited from the uh, uh, mid-1940s and really are no, no longer fit uh, for purpose. And at the top, a range of different uh, issues. So if you're in business, the stranded assets uh, issue is, is, is increasingly um, uh, urgent. But one of the issues we were talking about at dinner last night was the intergenerational tensions, which a number of us expect uh, to spread uh, in the coming decades. And that's not simply around issues like climate change. It's around uh, employment and the shift of the global economy to uh, Asia. It's about pensions. Uh, it's about access to uh, health care and so on. And these sorts of, this sort of steady backbeat of, of major issues, that's Hurricane Katrina, that's George W. Bush trying to respond to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, anyone who lives in California has seen a three-year drought now, which has been really quite uh, devastating. Increasing the signals are there for those with the uh, eyes to see. There's an angle here, which, if I get it right, works. Um, and these sorts of images, uh, particularly in Europe at the moment, very much in the media, uh, the whole time. And alongside that, we have the sustainable development uh, goals. Wonderful as far as they go, but I think 17 of anything is too many. If you, business leaders are starting to look at these uh, things and saying, where do we begin? You know, we can, we can remember three things, we can remember four things, 17 really problematic. This one's about cities, and I think increasingly cities should sit right at the heart uh, of all of this. And I think cities increasingly will frame the efforts uh, that companies uh, make. And as some of you will already discover, there are increasingly sort of toolkits that the Global Compact and others are, are offering, uh, both to business but potentially uh, for use by cities and other actors. And again, you're, you're finding um, uh, business school professors and, 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 and um, 
uh, Gail Whiteman is not only a, a, a business school professor, but she's also professor in residence at the World Business Council uh, for Sustainable uh, Development, starting to talk about a need for a shift in this world of business education, which um, uh, you know, many people didn't quite see coming. And I won't read the list of things that she's uh, talking about there, but um, I find that quite exciting. And just a quick few words uh, about the stretch agenda. I, I love graphene as a material, and one of the reasons I love graphene is the more you stretch it, the more extraordinary it becomes. And I think it's often true of... Uh, business leadership, the more you stretch business leaders and, and business teams and business cultures, the more extraordinary things uh, can uh, happen. And here's, here's a, just a record of companies stretching uh, in different parts of the world. It starts in 1997. It runs up to uh, last year. And you know, uh, particular companies come, this is by Globescan, particular companies come up and then crash back, Shell, uh, um, uh, Monsanto, uh, some disappear, like the body shop uh, taken over by uh, L'Oreal. Only one company comes right the way through all of this, which is Interface, the uh, U.S. carpet company. And uh, last year, we had the privilege of um, going into that company and interviewing over 20 people from the CEO right down to the shop floor. And part of what we were trying to find out is how had they managed to achieve three zero-based target. So Ray Anderson, who uh, was the company's founder, sadly uh, died a, uh, a few years back, but came up with the idea of uh, Mission Zero. And many of his colleagues thought he was absolutely clinically insane, that these zero-based targets weren't uh, poss possible. And then in Europe last uh, January, they announced that they'd hit three of them. Uh, zero fossil fuels, zero waste to landfill, and net zero water use. So we went and did a case study. Um, on how that happened. And what was really extraordinary was how one man's leadership had pervaded an entire uh, culture. Very difficult to uh, reproduce, but again, I think underscoring the importance uh, of leadership in all of this. It's going to become a much more taxing um, uh, environment for leaders to operate uh, in. Uh, many of you will have done the traditional adoption curve uh, work. Uh, uh, you'll also know that increasingly we're starting to see very different sort of adoption uh, curves coming through. So very early signals of something different uh, happening, often ignored, and then bang, sometimes called big bang, sometimes called the shark's uh, fin, very different sort of adoption curve now coming through. And just an, an extraordinary um, analysis done in the United States um, a few months uh, back of the implications. If you put Google, the Google car, autonomous car, you put Uber and some of these other uh, new uh, business models and technologies together, uh, the prediction is now being made that in, in, in the United States alone, 10 million jobs will disappear over the next uh, decade. That's the downside. The upside is suddenly cities are going to find them because transport becomes a utility. I mean, this may be 15 or 20 years, but it, the, 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 the the opportunity is immense. Suddenly, huge areas of cities and uh, uh, space in cities will be uh, liberated potentially for uh, other uses. So that, that increasingly is the context within which uh, leadership will need to take place. And I mentioned the EU uh, power uh, utilities. This was a, a diagram that The Economist uh, used to uh, uh, illustrate the collision between the old uh, fossil fuel, or, or in some cases, nuclear um, uh, industries, and, and the new uh, renewable uh, in, uh, industries, all of the smart grid uh, technologies and so on that are coming uh, through. And this is no longer just simply theory. This is something that has massive consequences uh, for companies. And I mentioned E.ON and RWE uh, earlier on. One of the ways that we've tried to capture what's now going on in leadership groups, and particularly in boards and C-suites, uh, is to... We were about five weeks before we had to send this uh, short report here to the printers, and I call it a short report because that's what it was meant to be. And then one of my colleagues, who uh, Alex and, and Peter both know, Sam Laka, I've worked with her for 10 years, just spoke out of frustration. She said, no, everyone's writing reports on these subjects now. No one's reading them. Why don't we do a play? 
and you know, we rocked on our heels slightly and said, oh, why don't we do a play? Why don't we do a dramatization of a, of, of a board going through the process uh, of thinking through some of these challenges and opportunities? And right at the end of the play, without wishing to give it all uh, away, two millennials stand up and say the sorts of stuff that no one else in the room was prepared uh, to say. So again, back to your uh, generation broadly, I think um, your voice is immensely important uh, in all of this. And if you look at particular companies, Dow Chemical is a company that I've worked with since uh, the late uh, 1980s. What you're starting to see in, in, in the goals that they're laying out for the coming 10 years, I mean, there's some conventional stuff. You know, engage employees around impact, increase uh, confidence uh, in chemical technology. Well, of course. Uh, but you've got things like circular economy. You've got breakthrough innovations. You've got valuing nature. Some new concepts are starting to come in which, uh, again, I find uh, immensely uh, exciting. Towards the conclusion, William Gibson is one of my very favorite uh, authors, science fiction uh, author. Uh, many of you will know uh, his uh, phrase, uh, the future's already here, it's just not yet uh, uh, evenly distributed. Uh, I think that what's coming through at us now will be really very different and, and in its way challenging, but uh, presenting all sorts of different Opportunities. And this is a way that about three, four months ago, I, I was going to Mexico to do a, a, a board meeting there, and I tried to capture what we thought was going on in this space. So this is an impact uh, 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 axis, and so it runs from bad impact. So when I first started in this field 40 years ago, I was doing environmental impact assessments, trying to minimize the, the shock waves from uh, development. Now you've got uh, this shift towards B corporations and so on, where uh, the whole emphasis is on positive impact. How do you create social and environmental value uh, in the world? So that, this is a huge shift going on. At the same time, you've got a shift from incrementalism, you know, it's good enough that you improve 1% or 2% a year or whatever, to increasingly an interest in uh, exponential solutions. Some of you will know X price, uh, Foundation, you'll know Peter Diamandis, you know the Singularity University, incredibly interesting work being done on new technologies and new mos models in that sort of space. And against that, we map three scenarios, breakdown, change as usual, and breakthrough. And just very quickly trying to put uh, some brands against that. Uh, so there are companies who are working in the breakdown space and making a lot of money. So G4S would be an example of a company that's building camps uh, for refugees and making money out of that, whether or not they do it well, you know, it, it, it is a matter of judgment. In the change as usual uh, space, uh, you've got people like the retailers, in this case uh, Walmart, starting to work with their uh, supply chains and, 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 and drive very different approaches, primarily often in the environmental space, but sometimes also in the social space as well. But in the breakthrough space, it's no longer just simply about incremental solutions. It's about fundamentally changing the system. You may remember Peter Backer was signaling uh, the need uh, for that. And, and um, I, I've only once driven a Tesla. It blew, blew my socks off. I wouldn't want to own one. But I mean, it's, it's an amazing piece of technology. But what's really interesting about Elon Musk is the way that he's talking about uh, giving away his patents to other people so that the electric car uh, notion spreads much more fast, uh, much faster, builds uh, critical mass, uh, and so on. This is a space that we're uh, particularly now interested in playing uh, into. And, and part of what we've been doing in, in the last couple of years is looking at the different forms of capital out there and how they're best uh, mobilized and brought into the space. So, uh, for example, this report is on corporate venture capital. And an example of that would be Intel has a corporate social responsibility, a corporate citizenship, a sustainability department, and they're probably mobilizing tens of millions of dollars. They also have a corporate venture capital fund, which has $11 billion under management last time we looked at it. How do we get through uh, to these people? Uh, and what we find is that the, these people have very often not met the new breed of impact investors, at least as yet. And then we're also involved in the social stock exchange. It's uh, an early experiment to try and get stock markets to think uh, differently. Final few slides. Um, and, and luckily, this chimes, this message chimes with what the 
that the group here, the presidents, were just saying, which is we cannot expect everyone else to address these changes. Increasingly, it's something that we're going to have to uh, do ourselves. And this is a, a, a way of characterizing uh, where we are in all of this. And some of you will have seen it. I can see it from your faces, and others won't. But it, for me, it's a, it's, it's a very powerful description of, of where we are. And I'll just give you one uh, example. Leaders Quest is a wonderful group that some of you will know takes uh, leadership groups from major companies. So Barclays, I, I went with a leadership group of 140 people, including their CEO, into a slum in Nairobi. They take 140 people from Bain into a landfill site in, in, in Mumbai and leave them there for a week. I mean, they work with them, but I mean, it's meant to shock these people into a different consciousness. Leaders Quest took uh, the chairman of one of the very big German car companies to uh, um, Silicon Valley earlier this year. Uh, it wasn't VW. Um, they took him to see, among others, uh, to see Uber. Uber were typically arrogant and basically quite aggressive and said, we don't know why you're here to this um, chairman who was used to being treated like uh, royalty and basically said, 10 years from now, you will not exist. And one of the Leaders Quest people went into the men's room afterwards, and this chairman was in there as well. And he was very serious, very, very grown-up man. And he suddenly said, fucking hell. <laughs> and he, he said, something began to shift in my brain. I suddenly saw a future which I could, I, up to that point, I had never uh, seen. And so part of what I think we've got to do is get leaders of all sorts out into this space so they see that uh, future with their own uh, eyes. And that, that includes sustainability uh, people as well, because I think very often sustainability people are trying to keep the elements of the old order, biodiversity or a stable climate there. One of the big problems we have, this is Pamela Hartigan, co-founder of um, uh, Volans, now at the Skoll Center at the Said Business School. One of the big problems that we have with business education, and you all know it, is the ranking criteria against which uh, schools are judged. And somehow, we've got uh, to embrace that collective challenge of changing the criteria such that they cover some of the issues uh, that students are increasingly uh, interested in, but also business wants in the talent that it uh, recruits uh, from business schools and elsewhere. So this final slide. Um, Blackboards get us uh, uh, so far, and this is Ed Gillespie, I think, will be talking here uh, later, and, and uh, we were with him at Futera, I think, the week before last, working with a, a client, and this is a blackboard in, 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 in their uh, conference room, but I just want to go back to uh, the image that I used earlier on of graphene, this notion of, of, of stretched, um, uh, in that case, materials, in, in this case, uh, networks that are actually um, designed to stretch uh, their uh, members. I think this is an immensely exciting period in all of this. Um, and I think that, uh, Oikos, your, your network, uh, your work is way more important than you may actually realize. It's quite interesting. It's only just occurred to me. But when you look at the structure of this, you're almost seeing something like a, a, a chemical uh, catalyst. Your power is way beyond your numbers. It's way beyond uh, your, your, your apparent uh, strength. So congratulations to you all for how far you've come uh, already. But as I said right at the beginning, I'm going home now and leaving it all to you to sort out. And uh, very good luck uh, with that. Oh, just one, one tiny thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, back to VW. Uh, I was with a group of people at the Social Stock Exchange, and it was a bunch of different investors. And somebody stood up and said, um, oh, it's, um, it was Ian, Sir Ian Cheshire who used to run Kingfisher. And he said, VW is in a position where nobody who's really bright will want to work with them at the moment. My response was, that may be true, but actually if I were uh, young and talented, VW is exactly where I'd want to work because they're beginning to think about becoming an electric car company over time. Transformative change. Incredible opportunity uh, to drive the future in new directions. Anyway, thank you very much indeed for your patient attention. And um, 